Good evening guys, I'm bringing it to you old school, holding the microphone in my hand, and uh, I'm doing that because, because it, it feels good. But what's really going on is that it's July of the year 2019, and although there's no hoverboards yet, we can at least reminisce and saturate ourselves in nostalgia for the moon landings, which happened exactly this month, 50 years ago. And, uh, no, I'm not a moon landing denier. I believe in science. And that's why I trust that this book is an authority, and therefore I can be the deliverer, the messenger, if you will. Call me Mercury. Of, of the frontier, our final frontier. At least one of them, because the mind, I think, is, uh, arguably a more important frontier, more significant for us, at least, frontier to delve into. That's why I like psychology and history and philosophy. But, aside from that, I really, really have a passion for some of the more interesting, awe-inspiring information that we, we know currently. And um, it taps into our deepest desires to just explore and uh, dive into the great unknown. So let's honor the... Uh, the great explorers of the intellect. Oh, one sec. Yeah, but for real, that guy, he deserves every bit of the recognition that he gets, and that his name, and the fact that his name has been synonymous with genius. I genuinely do appreciate that guy. I revere him and his intellect and the thousands of other men and women like him who have added to our total, sum total of human knowledge about the world in the past and um, helping us to drive relentlessly into the future to hopefully amount to something better than the current state of humanity that we have. So what I hope to accomplish in the next hour or so is I think for anybody to be truly raptured by the the, the enormity of, of things that we do know. The universe is ridiculously complex as is you know our minds but it's amazing. It, it's truly inspiring to know how much we've um, been able to get clued in to the inner workings of the universe. So for me to understand, for me to appreciate exactly what geniuses like this guy really went through, it's useful to um, get a general knowledge of, of what, what it takes and what's behind and, and uh, the methods and the seriousness with which we try to sincerely probe the natural laws of the universe. It's not just, you know, it's a... Uh, I guess in a way I just want to show appreciation for the actual... the intellect and um, the rigor that it takes to be a scientist and the patience and the observations and the, the scrutiny that uh, you know, men today are still getting, men and women, as well as men like Galileo, you know, and, and people who, um, were, whose life were, were generally on, genuinely on the line, um, in the past. So, without further ado, let's get into this amazing book as a, uh, little part of a series increasingly astronomy based that I'm going to be doing in, uh, in the next month, over the next couple months I guess. I'm going to be talking about the Apollo program, uh, the M87, black hole, um, and yeah, just more astronomy in general. So I hope you guys like it and uh, let's, let's dive into the heavens. So 
here on the left is essentially what we know, what we're confident in, what we can predict. And then on the right is speculations about alien life and uh, phenomena that we expect, maybe, such as, uh, you know, wormholes in hyperspace. Just everyday objects like that. Here we go. Stepping stones to the universe. And I like this opening statement. It really puts into perspective, sets us up to learn the background of what astronomers currently are extremely, extremely confident in. And how they've, uh, you know, how they've figured out their, their current toolkit for exploring the universe. It says, the travelers in the Star Trek universe boldly go where no one has gone before to explore the final frontier, space. No human has yet visited any object outside our solar system, but that's not stopped us from exploring new worlds. At long range, using telescopes on the surface of the Earth and from satellites um, orbiting in our atmosphere, the data from these observations are then compared with what we can infer about stars and galaxies and other phenomena in the cosmos from laws of physics. In astronomy, theory and observation always go hand in hand. A theory about stars is useless without observations to test the predictions of the theory. Okay, and observations of a new, of a startling new phenomenon remain, they're going to remain a mystery until they can be understood from within the whole framework of what our current equations and formulae and ideas in physics and mathematics already uh, currently are. Together, the theory and the observation can take us on a journey to the furthest reaches of the universe and back in time to when the universe was born. So it makes a point saying that our standard of success in experiment and science in general is a coalescence of observation and theory. The observation doesn't fit the theory. We have to readjust the theory. The theory doesn't define the observation. Again, it's wrong. It needs to be readjusted because... Or, or the observation just needs to be reinterpreted, maybe. Making maps of space. Astronomers, they're interested in the evolution of stars and galaxies and how they're born and how they change over time and eventually die, some of them, to anthropomorphize it. And in the tracing, in tracing the origin and ultimately the fate of the entire universe, putting this type of knowledge together with of the distances between cosmic objects, it enables astronomers to achieve an understanding of their domain and, and more accurately map out um, within what territory they're actually working. By studying the light emitted by stars and galaxies, astronomers are able to find what kinds of different objects exist in parts of the universe. But they also need to measure the distances to the cosmic objects, so they know where they are in relation to one another. And how can the distances to the stars and galaxies even, that we have no hope of ever visiting, even with an unmanned space probe, be measured? It sounds like an impossible task. But astronomers, being the optimists that they are, and having faith in persistent adherence to what is true from observed fact 
in what is logical from mathematical equations, they, they found that uh, stepping stones they've taken have effectively helped them to understand and continually understand the ever unfolding phenomena that we observe in the universe. And I love this part here, it's, it's all done with triangles, it goes back in the history and lets us know that uh, that ninth grade geometry course you took is actually the fundamental, uh, or one of the huge cornerstones of our understanding of the universe, let alone electronics and um, eh, all technologies that we have. And it's why the bridges you go over rarely, if ever, collapse. It's why the buildings are meant to sway, to absorb impacts, to uh, withstand some earthquakes, perhaps. Um, as the Chinese proverb says, the longest journey begins with a single step. That's so true. And the geographical exploration of the universe, of course, starts with a simple piece of geometry involving triangles. The first step into the universe uses exactly the same kind of surveying techniques used here on Earth to measure the distances to distant objects, such as mountains without actually having to go up there. That's, that's how we uh, were able to actually measure the elevation of, say, Mount Everest, because it's not like we can drill, go up to the summit and drill a hole vertically down and uh, just drop a measuring tape to see how high it is. We actually measure it by triangulating it. And uh, we'll explore what that is right now. The idea itself isn't new, it's, uh, but with the aid of new instruments here on Earth and in satellites orbiting the Earth, it reaches further than ever before. It all depends on the geometry of triangles. If you know, as we most all do after studying Pythagorean theorem and other uh, properties of right triangles, the length of one side of a triangle, the base, say, if you know that length, and you can measure the angle of each of the other two sides from that base, then it's a simple matter to calculate how far it is from the base of the triangle to, as we can see here, the opposite tip. So. The process is called triangulation. The trouble with triangulation is that you need a longer baseline to measure the distances to more distant objects. So here with a mountain, um, so if they know, let's say they can observe a peak and they know the distance from here to this guy over here, and I'm sorry for those of you just listening, but just picture two humans on a flat ground at the base of a mountain, different, uh, you know, maybe a mile or two apart, both looking at the same peak. These humans, um, as long as one defines his perspective as the, uh, I don't know, we'll say uh, the adjacent side. And then this guy a mile away defines his perspective as the um, hypotenuse. At least these guys are going to be, be able to know that. Let's see, they're going to be able to know the two angles and the distance here. And that's going to give them the distance from this guy to the mountain and this guy to the uh, mountain summit as well. Let's see, how are they going to measure the angles though? As far as doing that, I believe it's, um, you can visually, you can visually determine those angles. So once you do, it's just a simple matter of applying the known distance and the known angles right here. And of course, the third angle is um, made into, it's, it's the holes 
experiment is set up so that the third angle here is a right triangle at 90 degrees. You just use your trig functions and uh, you can figure out the distance to the third point that the two um, observers are, uh, are both looking at. So triangulation is not restricted to measuring distances on Earth. It works very well for measuring the distance to our nearest neighbor in space, the Moon. So if one observer has his friend go all the way over maybe, uh, maybe 20 miles away, a significant distance where the Moon is no longer directly overhead of the second guy, what, what's going to happen is that the, the guy standing directly under the moon, when the moon is at the zenith in the sky, his angle with relationship to the second guy is going to form a right triangle. Then that means the other guy is going to be over here at more of a, uh, an acute angle between the moon and uh, the first guy. So then it's easy work to figure out the distance of the moon, about 384,000 kilometers and uh, 220,000 miles from the geometry of triangles. And actually the phenomena that would make the moon appear in a different part of the sky to the two observers measuring it it's called what we call parallax. It's the same thing as if you, uh, let me move the camera there for you guys watching. You know, for, you can see the book, the text on the book move as I move the camera back and forth. Even though I'm keeping my finger, I'm holding my finger out for those of you just listening. Um, it's the same thing you guys do. We can all do if we, um, you see the moon out, and you can actually hide it behind the tip of your thumb. I'll do it right there. And um, if you close one eye and uh, switch back and forth between the eyes, parallax is what we call that phenomena, where the background object, the moon or the text of this book, appears to shift. Um, but that's really just because you're shifting your perspective with each eye, and that's actually a huge, um, a really significant tool that astronomers use, especially, you know, before advanced technologies were uh, invented, to measure distances to the planets and the sun and um, other cosmic phenomena. So, yeah, it's the stars that are actually the things that we we use as a, a fixed, just for the purposes of measuring the moon, we use the stars as a fixed background so that we can see if we travel 100 miles on Earth and then look at the moon in both situations, what actually happens is that this guy, he's going to see these stars back here, and this guy is going to see these stars um, a different set of stars behind the moon and we all and the stars are a fairly constant phenomenon so we know um, we can use those as a standard against which to uh, measure the distance to the moon and measuring the uh, using parallax to measure things beyond the moon, which is most things in the universe for us, it, it works, um, at least for objects in our solar system, but we have to go to opposite ends of the earth, so not just, you know, 10 or, or 50 miles away, but thousands of miles away to form a long enough base triangle um, to make the measurement possible. Um, just to give you guys a, an idea, we, you know, because if we're, so if we're here on the Earth, um, you know, our triangle, 
to measure the moon can be made by a relatively short distance, but when we're, you know, way measuring things like planets, um, orders of magnitude further away from us than the moon is, our triangle, if it's the same baseline, is going to be really, really, really thin, so what we have to do is try our best to, uh, to measure from as far away, create a, as big a baseline as possible. measurement here. And then of course, once we know, once we're aware of, if we make this one the right triangle, so we know that angle, and we know the distance between here to here, because uh, we know the diameter of the Earth, and we know this angle. Well, yeah, we know both angles, really. So then we can figure out the distance x and y of those sides. So it's, um, it's just pretty amazing how powerful, and of course, how powerful they are. And of course, once we had the technology to um, send satellites into orbit, then we have the ability to uh, increase, you know, if we have two satellites or even one satellite orbiting the Earth. Then we have the ability to increase that baseline and start measuring things much further away. And actually, um, you know, something interesting that... Uh, astronomers figured out pretty early on is that we can measure stars by waiting until the orbit of the actual Earth around the Sun is on the opposite side, is halfway complete. So measurements taken 180 days apart actually makes a huge, makes a baseline of, um, you know, 180 million miles, which is a lot bigger than whatever the diameter of the Earth is, uh, you know, what is that, like 10,000 miles or something? So you can imagine, you know, the object could be much, much, much further away using that method. So, where do we leave off? Parallax of Mars was determined accurately in 1671. <laughs> That's almost 350 years ago. That's amazing. Before, 100 years before, um, America was a country. When the French astronomer Jean Richet led an expedition to French Guyana, South America to measure the position of Mars against the background of stars at a certain time on the appointed night um, over several nights to uh, account for the weather on the same nights and at the same times back in Paris the Italian born astronomer Giovanni Cassini I'm sure many of you history uh, astronomy buffs rather are familiar with the name Cassini from the probe also made observations of the position of Mars against the background of the stars. So when Richet's expedition returned, they collaborated and were able to calculate the distance. These measurements were particularly, pat <laughs> particularly important because they uh, made it possible to work out the geography of the entire solar system. The laws which described the motion of the planets around the sun were described early in the 17th century by Johannes Kepler and explained 
by Isaac Newton with his theory of gravity. They state that if planet A is twice as far from the sun as planet B, then the orbital period of planet A, the time it takes to orbit, the whole um, complete one orbit, is a certain multiple of the orbital period of planet B. Interesting. I, I love I love how it just fits into a uh, into a law, a rational law, and it uh, other than Einstein's theory of relativity, it doesn't deviate from it much at all. So astronomers thus had to measure at least one planetary distance directly in order to put real numbers into the equations, even though they already knew the orbital periods of, uh, for the planets. By measuring the distance, um, or first, let's see, uh, Once astronomers, uh, pointing to this picture here, where we turn the page, had determined the sizes of galaxies, they could even use triangulation to estimate the distances between them from how small the galaxies looked on the sky. Imagine that. So by measuring the distance to just Venus and Mars, they were able to calculate the distance from the Sun to each of these planets. Once they knew these distances, they were able to use Kepler's laws to calculate the distance from the Sun to all the other planets, so uh, including the Earth. In addition, they could use Newton's laws to calculate what the mass of the sun must be to hold the planets in the observed orbits. By the end of the 17th century, astronomers were able to calculate the distance from the Earth to the sun fairly accurately. The observations have been improved since then, though, um, we can even measure the distance to Venus directly by bouncing radar signals off it. And the distance from the Earth to the Sun is now known to be 149 million kilometers, about 4,000 times the uh, distance around the equator of the Earth. But even 200 years ago, the calculated distance was more, uh, was 140 million kilometers an error of less than 7%, which is ridiculously, uh, it's amazing. That's, you know, now I wonder, I, I don't wonder at all how these guys, especially back then when they weren't kind of jaded by the power of technology, I feel like we, we take things for granted, you know, we get upset when the internet connection takes a second longer, even a half second longer than it should, or we think it should, and uh, these guys back then, they had no electricity, no steam engines even, I mean, this is three, four hundred years ago, it's no wonder that they took their entire adult lives to meticulously and diligently observe the stars and the motions of the planets. Especially once they were able to, uh, you know, make predictions about where they're going to be in the night sky. And those predictions come true with a very minimal error. That's, that's astonishing, really. It's really awesome. It's really something. So, a stepping stones to the stars. It takes the Earth 
12 months to orbit the sun once. The radius of the Earth's orbit, the distance from the Earth to the sun, is roughly 150 million kilometers, 90 million miles. Distance is called one astronomical unit, or AU. So whenever you see, you know, so in this and this, this common is 20 AU um, from the sun, or something like that. That's the uh, the unit. It's vitally important in astronomy because it provides a new baseline with which to measure the parallaxes for more distant objects. The nearest stars. So, like I said, at intervals of six months, um, the Earth is at opposite sides of the Sun, of course. And this is such a long baseline that in photographs of the night sky taken six months apart, few, uh, a few of the stars even seem to have shifted slightly because of the parallax effect. But the shift is very, very, very slight because the stars are so far away. To give you some idea of the, how small the effect is, in the 1830s the first star studied in this way, known as 61 Cygni, was found to have a parallax shift of just 0.31 seconds of arc. So let me, uh, let me get my little pad. So 0 0.3, 0 0.31 seconds of arc. What that translates to is that in the night sky we have, you know, if we look on the horizon, we have a half circle. And this circle is divided into um, 180 degrees. Because the whole, the whole circle would be 360 degrees, right? So an easy way to... Um, formulate that in your head is you can break these up in the halves so if we broke 180 in half that would be 90 degrees we'll call that 0, we'll call that 180 um, this in half would be 45 uh, you can break that in the thirds nicely so that's 15 degrees and so from here to just here you know looking into the sky it's pretty much almost the horizon you break that into 15 units, each of those little units right there is one degree. One degree. Now, if we take that one degree and zoom in, this is a really bad drawing. Um, we pretend that's one degree. One degree is broken up into 60 arc minutes. So there's 30 and there's 60 right there. And so if you can imagine, again, and remember this whole thing right here is just one degree right here and there's 180 of those from horizon to horizon in the night sky when you look look at it. And so this one degree, as you can imagine where I'm going with this, this one, one degree broken up in the 60 arc minutes. Um, and I, I put degrees there, it's actually little uh, apostrophes. And that's broken into, so one arc minute then broken further into 60 arc seconds. So there we go. One arc minute. It's broken into, you know, break it in half, it's 30 um, arc seconds. 60 arc seconds right there. 60 arc seconds. So there you go. There, if if they need to go any deeper or break it up and to get any higher resolution, what they do is 
use the uh, conventions for the metric system for breaking units into fractions of um, hundreds, thousands, millions, billions. So they would use the Latin prefixes, uh, micro for millions, nano for billions. So if it's, if they're taking measurements of galaxies, you know, billions of years away, and there's slight measurements, they want to, uh, maybe the width of a galaxy 10 billion years away, they might be measuring that in not degrees, not minutes, not even seconds, but microseconds, arc seconds, really, is what they call it. So, um, so that's degrees, that's... minutes and this is arc seconds and I'm a little bit embarrassed at how chicken scratch that looked but so so yeah the uh, in the 1830s and imagine you know the the 1800s was the, um, the the boom of the Industrial Revolution. They had steam engines. They uh, around the you know the middle of the century they started implementing a lot of electric um, not machines, but the theory of electricity was slowly being shifted into um, practical devices. They were uh, slowly, it was shifting from more of a scientific curiosity into implementing it in, uh, you know, by the 1900s, early 1900s, we would actually be having entire city grids fused, infused with electricity, being run on electricity. So, you know, their uh, technology wasn't ancient, but it certainly wasn't as advanced as today. So in the 1830s, they're measuring just 30, uh, one third of an arc second. So imagine that that's one degree, that's one sixtieth of one sixtieth. Oh, sorry. So one third of an arc second would be one third of one sixtieth of one sixtieth of one, 180, um, 180th of the entire night sky, to uh, give you an idea. So that would be, alright, I had to get the calculator out real quick, so that would be The sky was broken into 180 pieces. That was broken into 60 minutes each, which is broken into 60 seconds for each minute. And then that was broken into three, that last second, which makes, that's the measurement of the star, 61 Cygni, 0.31 arc seconds is breaking the sky into almost two million pieces, if you can imagine that, two million pieces of pie to measure the, uh, the slight, 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 slight shift that we were able to measure of, uh, through the parallax effect of one of the closer stars against the much more distant background stars. And using that, we were able to figure out that, uh, See if they say well, we were able to figure out roughly the uh, distance to 61 Cygni, and they, I like how they elaborate on that. At that uh, in comparison. 
appears in the full moon, yeah, to give you an idea, covers 30 seconds of arc in the night sky. 30 seconds. So, half a minute, yeah. I feel like that's... The moon would be bigger than that. Is it really? Just 30 seconds? I would think it's... I guess, I guess a degree is a little bit bigger than it looks on paper. So the apparent shift in 61 Cygni as the Earth goes around the Sun was equivalent to about one six thousandth of the diameter of the Moon. The apparent, because it's apparent to us from our perspective. That's what the Moon, uh, how much space the Moon takes up in the night sky, from here on Earth at least. The distance to the stars are so great that the astronomers had to invent new units with which to describe them. If you were so far away from the Earth that the distance between the Earth and the Sun, again the radius um, being 1 AU, covered just one second of arc on the sky, then you would be one park parsec away from the Earth. So, it's one arc second. So when, you know, when we're measuring things in space, distance is so, so enormous that you have You have to use units even bigger than um, the distance between the Earth and the Sun. And what that means is that they took, you know, the Sun. Let's see. So we got the Sun here, the Earth. goes around, we have some distant, distant star. And what they're able to do is, I should make it more lined up. Must have been a black hole right here to make the light ray bend. But uh, yeah, they were able to measure, so they, they took units Instead of this, 1 AU, 1 AU, they started looking at um, using a, a unit that, I'm trying to figure out how they derived it, but nonetheless, they, they took a, a, an object that would be so distant, that, you know, I just said it, but um, that this AU would be equivalent to just one arc second parsec. So that stands for parallax second of arc. So the distance between here and the sun, or the earth, I mean it really almost doesn't matter at that far of a distance, that is a parsec. So, and of course this is, um, I'd say millions, millions of times further than an AU. So that's what they measure, um, you know, distances like the Han Solo's Kessel Run. It, it does have a very futuristic sounding ring to it, doesn't it? A parsec. So it's a unit of distance that's 30 million million kilometers. It's really, yeah, it's hard to visualize. That's an understatement. Um, so it's 3.26 light years to give uh, our units. So 
you know, more familiar understanding. So, actually, yeah, I think when I first learned this, um, not too long ago, it's if one parsec is 3.26 light years, very roughly, you can equate it and make the analogy between a foot and a yard, or a foot and a meter. So, the light year would be the foot, the parsec would be roughly three times what the light year is, being the yard. So converting the parallax measurement into distance, we find that 61 Cygni is 3.4, or you know, roughly 10 light years, 3.4 parsecs away. Or, uh, oh, <laughs> they, of course they would have it. Just over 11 light years from us, and amazingly this makes it one of the closest stars to the sun. So when you look up at the night sky on a dark and cloud-free night, it seems to contain countless stars and poets have wax lyrical about the view, but the human eye is not very sensitive to faint light, even under the perfect, most perfect conditions. With no moon or cloud, and far from city lights, the most you can see at any one time is about only 3,000 stars. But nonetheless, I mean, that's still... I live, uh, unfortunately, a little too close to West Palm Beach, Port St. Lucie. And I've been out in the mountains, uh, I think two years ago. I went out into the mountains with my girlfriend. And... Was it in um, Boone and Blowing Rock, North Carolina. It was so dark out there that I actually had to uh, I had to, to, to do a double take when I stepped out of the car and looked up one night on a clear night. I guess it had been a little cloudy a couple nights, and uh, it opened up one night, and I looked up, and I thought there was maybe a, a meteor shower or an aurora or something because I could see the Milky Way as an actual stream of a concentrated stream of stars crossing the entire night sky and to me that was odd it was it was well, the winter times it was cold I had a jacket on and uh, I was in the mountains breathing that fresh mountain air it was just one of the most divine experiences I've had. It was beautiful. So needless to say, I stood out there for a good long while, looking at the stars, just basking, basking in that view. So awesome. So beautiful. Anyways, believe it or not, there's more to the night sky than just what our... Uh, impressive little ape eyes can see. The true number of stars in the sky only began to be appreciated at the beginning of the 17th century. That was in the 1600s when Galileo Galilei turned his telescope on the night sky. He found that what seemed to be a faintly glowing cloud of light was actually a myriad of individual stars, each, each too faint to be seen by the unaided human eye. He announced his discoveries in the book, The Starry Messenger, which was published in 1610. At that time, there was no accurate way to estimate the distances to the vast majority of these stars, until very recently only a few stellar distances actually had been measured directly by parallax. By the end of the 19th century, just 60 stellar distances had been measured in this way. In this way, uh, at the end of the 20th century though, the situation had improved dramatically when the Hipparchus satellite from a famous Greek astronomer, orbiting near 
uh, clear of the obscuring influence of the Earth's atmosphere, measured the distances of a large number of stars with unprecedented accuracy. It pinned down the parallaxes of more than 100,000 stars to an accuracy of point, um, say, two thousandths of an arc second. But even this impressive achievement gives the distances to less than one millionth of the total numbers of the stars in the Milky Way. taking the range of directly measured stellar distances out to a few hundred parsecs. So even with the aid of satellites like Hipparchus, astronomers still need other techniques to measure distances to stars outside our local region of space. The most important of these techniques is called the moving cluster method. It gives the distance to a, uh, a large group of stars called the Hyades Cluster. Hyades? Hyades. Hyades. Maybe the Hyades. These stars are about 40 parsecs, or 130 light years, away from us, and all move as a group through space, meaning they're gravitationally bound to each other. And, uh, Hipparchus has just proven, I guess recently, confirmed the distance from us to that cluster. Because this cluster contains hundreds of stars with different colors and brightnesses, the fact that they are all the same distance away helps astronomers to understand how brightness is related to the color of the light emitted in subtle ways. The color of a star has no relation to its distance. Its brightness tells us how far away it is. So the color of a star has no relation to the distance. It's uh, the brightness that tells us how far away they are. It says, then, let me a little excerpt here. When they see a star with the same color as the one as one of the types of Hyades stars, they can estimate its distance by comparing its brightness, or faintness, with the Hyades star. So, crucially, the subtle differences in color of the stars involved are revealed by a technique called spectroscopy, probably the single most important tool astronomers use. And this is really cool here. This little excerpt they decided to put is um, an overview of what spectroscopy is. It's essentially how white light and uh, you know what, let me show you guys real quick just to make it real practical. I'm going to show you that the um, the LED lights on my bookshelf, when I turn them white, well, all the lights, all the different colors that it makes are only made up of red, white, or red, red, blue, and green LEDs, varied, uh, whose brightness is varied, and that makes all, all the visible colors to us. So here's white light, and when I get close, I'll show you guys exactly how um, exactly how you can get how you can analyze different shades of white light and it can be broken up into various colors various colors of uh, along the spectrum
So we got some uh, refraction happening in the camera lens there that was able to hopefully I'll remember to leave that part in. And that really shed light. I, it's super cool in person obviously. You can put your eye right up next to the LED. Make sure it's kind of dim by the way if you try this. If you want to try this at home. Um, and you can see it looks white from a distance. It's just like a, you know, a TV. It looks white from a distance and you put your eye right up next to it and all it is is three different colors red blue and green at equal in at an equal intensity if I made the red go way up and kept the blue and green the same it would turn into a more pink hue or red um, I think when you you know red and blue raised when green is kept low that makes more purple um, blue and green I think make yellow even though I know blue and yellow make green in real life anyways it's it to me it's awesome so and it's you know all the amazing properties of light is what allows astronomers to know so much when they say oh yeah, that star has uh, this amount of uh, composition of iron in it, this percentage of carbon and hydrogen. They're able to actually figure that out using spectroscopy. This depends on the fact that atoms of any particular chemical, the element, um, any, any chemical, they radiate energy if they're hot at the very, very precise wavelengths of the rainbow spectrum, the electromagnetic spectrum, that correspond to the orbital uh, distances of their electrons. Alright, so I know uh, there's going to be at least a couple of you physicists, uh, or at least more intelligent and knowledgeable people out there than myself. So feel free to correct me in the comments, but from what I understand, if we have an atom, and you know, we have some protons and neutrons in the center there, in the nucleus, the atom's kind of made of these different shells, just to keep it two-dimensional, and it's surrounded by electrons on these shells. Now, if one of these, if you, um, shoot a light which has wave-like properties but nonetheless can be emitted in particle form at least just for the purpose of my my understanding of it when it gets blasted when this atom say a, a metal bar is being blasted by light so we have a piece of metal being bombarded by sunlight let's say and light is hitting it in the form of waves, but it's also energy. It's giving energy to this electron. And what that's going to do, it's like uh, giving an energy bar to a guy so that he can hike up the mountain. So now this electron sits up here. And this whole atom as a whole absorbs light from a particular wavelength that corresponds to the distance, or uh, at least the the energy that it took to jump that uh, to that higher energy state of the orbital. And now later on, as atoms and electrons have a tendency to release, uh, or at least move down to a lower energy state, this electron, say it's over here now, it's going to jump back down to a lower energy state, just like a guy who could uh, jump off a cliff safely into the water for our family friendly purposes here. <laughs> when it does that, it's going down to a lower energy state, which means it's getting rid of energy. It doesn't have as much energy anymore. And that's going to release a photon, which velocity but it does not have 
mass. For some reason, a photon only has a measurable velocity. That's the speed of light in a vacuum. But it doesn't have a measurable mass, which is really, really weird. So it's massless. It's a massless particle. That's a photon. But anyways, that's generally how it works. Spectroscopy measures light through a prism. And that prism breaks it into red all the way to blue. And um, when it's pure white light, that's made up of all the colors of the visible spectrum. But when it's from stars, it's certain wavelengths of light are actually missing. So it'll be completely black. Because that star is full of elements that don't, um, that, oh, that absorb, yeah, that's what it is. They absorb light from these specific wavelengths. So the star itself as a whole won't be emitting light from those wavelengths because there's atoms over here uh, absorbing them but uh, just like a the reason the trees you know leaves are green the reason leaves are green is because absorbing all the colors of the sun that it's getting except green it doesn't uh, accept the wavelength green for some reason so it bounces that back and takes all the uh, the other colors to allow was it chloro Chlorophyll, that's what it is. Chlor, chlorophyll. To undergo photosynthesis. And that's, some for some reason, green just doesn't jive with it. So the flame test here, in this, uh, over here gives you kind of an idea what that is this is the distinctive fingerprint of helium gas right here okay. we know which spectroscopic barcode corresponds to a particular element because the light emitted by elements has been studied using simple flame tests. So a sample of a known element, perhaps a piece of copper wire, is heated, often using a simple Bunsen burner, burner and the light in it, uh, the light it radiates when it's heated is passed through a triangular prism. This spreads the light out and produces a pattern of lines that is unique to that element. Um, and then they can build up a database of what unique uh, spectroscope uh, spectral lines each element produces as they test different elements. Uh, it was invented in the 1800s. Then the first person noticed that light from the sun when uh, passed through a prism to make a spectrum contain many distinct lines. Um, British physicist William Wall Wollaston, 1802, he had no idea what they were, but he discovered that. Then the German Joseph Fraunhofer counted 574 lines. But the person who explained it was the famous guy every electrical engineer knows, Kirchhoff. He, uh, these were lines caused by the presence of different elements in the atmospheres of stars. He pioneered the basic principles 
in scientific spectroscopy in collaboration with Robert Bunsen, <laughs> appropriately enough. So, the spectroscopic studies of light from the sun's atmosphere obtained during an eclipse in 1868 showed a distinctive pattern of lines which did not correspond to any known element. Then the uh, astronomer took that and ran with it, and concluded that there must be an element in the sun that had not been discovered on Earth. So he gave the element the name helium from uh, helios, the uh, Greek word for the sun. Helium was actually identified on Earth in 1895, and Lockyer received a knighthood, partly as a result of his famous prediction in 1897. Spectroscopy had, an, had actually found an element in our nearest star before it had been found on Earth. That's amazing. It's just one of the many, uh, many things you have to respect science for. And science isn't some entity, it's not some god, it's, it's a method. It's a methodology of coming up with interesting ideas and testing them, and seeing if they work. And I love that most science isn't completed by, uh, you know, even Einstein, who made the most famous breakthrough ever. He acknowledged that he was standing on the shoulders of giants, and, and that's the only reason, in his own words, he could see so far. That's, uh, on top of it being a very democratic, very communal, cooperative enterprise, even though sometimes it's definitely not when it comes to egos and who made what, who's gonna keep the Nobel Prize money. Um, it, it's also a, a testament to the humility of an individual to recognize he wouldn't be where he was if it wasn't for, you know, this guy making an observation that the sun produced definite lines like this. And, um, and then some other guy coming along and counting the lines. And there is one... One other vitally important use of spectroscopy and astronomy, although the lines corresponding to a particular um, element are always produced in the same distinctive wavelengths, if the object is making the lines uh, as it's moving, and when it comes to astronomy and especially galaxies, you have objects moving so fast that they're actually approaching um, speeds that you have to name in terms of light speed, relative to light, light speed, so uh, in percentages of light speed. And that's when the, the idea behind red and blue shifting stars and galaxies comes into play. If the object is moving towards us, the lines are actually shifted to shorter or bluer wavelengths. I think of blue as being more high energy, and it, and it really is when you uh, when you go to nightclubs. They want to stimulate you; they'll put blue lights, and if they want to mellow you out, they'll put red lights in because red lights are the more less energetic wavelengths. So, as of course the cosmological objects are moving further away, they're wavelengths are being stretched, and therefore those objects are being red shifted. And this is known as the Doppler effect, and it enables astronomers to measure how fast stars are moving through space. Um, how fast galaxies are rotating, and how fast even binary systems such as stars are orbiting each other. So, spectroscopy tells us what stars are made of, how fast they're moving, what mass they have. So without spectroscopy, 
There would be little more to astronomy than making pretty patterns called constellations in the night sky. Stephen's Quartet Group of Galaxies in NGC 7320. Color coding shows the different redshift values of the quartet members. Wow, look at that. So you can, all, you can see the uh, red specks right there. I believe those, and of course all the blue that dominates, are... Uh, and that's the, I guess, an exaggeration of the red and blue Doppler effects, the shifts they undergo. So, where did we leave off? So the result of applying such methods is that we're now we now have a clear idea of the distances between the stars and also of their sizes. The distance from one star to uh, even its nearest neighbor is usually tens of millions of times its own diameter. Um, except for binary systems, of course. For example, the Sun has a diameter of 1.39 million kilometers and it's pretty typical for a main period star like our sun, our star. If the sun were the size of an aspirin, on this scale, to the nearest star would be another aspirin 140 kilometers away. I really, really, really love examples like that because it really proves just how, how far away the stars are. If I made the mark of a period, you know, I'd have to still go like a mile away to get to the nearest star. If, uh, you know, if the other star was also the mark of a period. So by using every possible technique for measuring distances to stars, astronomers have been able to map the collective, the collection of stars in which we live. This is the Milky Way. It's a uh, island in space we call galaxies. This is rather like trying to map a forest from the inside by working out the distances and relative positions of the trees in all different directions surrounding you. I like that analogy, that's pretty good. The process is aided by the fact that in parts of the galaxy there are great clouds of gas and dust between the stars. And these clouds, they contain large amounts of hydrogen, which can be detected by radio telescopes, measuring in just the radio wavelength. The overall shape of our galaxy is a flattened disk containing hundreds of billions of stars. We of course don't know what it looks like from the outside, but we assume based on looking at other galaxies, it looks something like this. Um, a flattened disk of stars embedded in a halo of globular clusters. So, hundreds of billions of stars in our galaxy, all of which mostly pretty similar to our star. The disk is only 300 parsecs thick and its outer regions, roughly 1% as thick as its width, but it has a bulge in the center measuring 7,000 parsecs across and, uh, and 1,000 parsecs thick. If we could view our galaxy from the outside, it would look kind of like a huge fried egg, I guess. Surrounding the whole disk is a halo of about 150 known bright star systems called globular clusters. So they're 
basically really, really, really dense miniature galaxies, little baby galaxies, and I, all the stars in them are really old, from what I understand. Yeah, they contain tens of thousands, all the way up to millions of stars in really, really tight spaces. And um, from the way those, you know, our stars and the globular clusters surrounding our galaxy move, astronomers have uh, had, you know, they've been forced to kind of say they don't really understand. There's a huge, um, like a really huge part of the equation that they're not being able to account for. And so they're just calling it dark matter. And uh, dark energy, I guess. Or no, maybe dark energy has to do with the expansion of the universe. But dark matter, at least, surrounding the whole galaxy and holding it, they think, is uh, holding it in a gravitational grip. And really, my little pet theory is that we tend to look at black holes as just something else to observe or look for in space, something confined to a, you know, something we don't understand and, you know, it's down to a singularity, but at least that singularity is confined to that one point in space that it, uh, that it happens to be and somehow crams all that matter into, but I think that might be a wrong perspective. I, I'm really intrigued by the idea that maybe a black hole is a some type of donut shape, you know, or, you know, some other shape we can't even imagine. And perhaps in the black hole, all that matter is, uh, let's see. So we have our galaxy, and we have all this matter, this black hole that is apparently has the, the gravity of millions of our suns. And so that means it must have that much matter contained inside a point, you know, the size of an atom. And not even an atom, but the nucleus of an atom. And so all that energy, maybe it, uh, I don't know, maybe it does something like a magnetic field in the Earth, where it creates a, I don't know, some type of protective donut. physics isn't run off of uh, feelings and emotions and um, hunches, or at least most of the time. Viewed from above, our galaxy has a distinctive structure with bright trails of stars called spiral arms twinning out from the central bulge. 
this is a very common feature of disk galaxies like the Milky Way. And uh, that's why they're called spiral galaxies. The most important distinction between the central bulge and the disk proper, however, is that the stars in the bulge in the globular clusters, stars in the halo surrounding the galaxy, are all really old stars. And they're perhaps 12 billion years old. I mean, that's almost as old as the uh, what we think the universe is currently. And for historical reasons, they're known as Population 2 stars. There's also very little gas or dust in the bulge, which makes sense, because if that was old, that would mean all the gas has plenty of time to uh, ultimately coalesce and condense into either sucked into other stars existing or formed into their own planet, uh, solar, stellar systems. And, um, so the disk, now the disk where the spiral arms twine outwards contains gas and dust and some old stars, but also middle-aged stars and all the young ones, which are known as population one stars. Sun being a, we actually are a population one star system. New stars are still being formed in the disk all the time. All the stars in the disk together with the gas and dust orbit around the center of the galaxy. Each star moves in independently just as each planet in our system moves independently, but they do form patterns. Um, the stars closer to the center, just as Mercury and Venus and us, they move faster than those around the edge, like Neptune and Pluto. And the sun is traveling at a speed of about 250,000 meters per second in its own orbit, carrying us along with it, of course. But the galaxy is so large that even this speed um, makes it take 225 million years to orbit the galaxy once. So it's only made it around about 20 times since our uh, since our uh, star system, solar system, was developed four and a half billion years ago. The sun and its family of planets orbits the galaxy at a distance of about nine kiloparsecs from the center, or two-thirds of the way out to the edge of the disk. So we're, uh, and we're actually right on the inside edge of what we call the Orion Arm, based on the Orion's belt. We're not in the center, and there's nothing in particular, there's nothing particularly special about our place in the Milky Way. Now the size and shape of the Milky Way galaxy were only really described properly in the 1920s. Before then, most people thought that the stars they could see in the sky made up the entire universe and everything there was but um, Hubble of course was a huge influence on disproving that theory and uh, we had as the technology of telescopes increased we were able to clarify these little fuzzy blobs we called nebulae, meaning clouds, um, into, into their modern distinct shapes shown by, you know, every other telescope out there. Best by Hubble, though. And we were able to finally reveal that, um, let's see if this is going to talk about that. We were able to look at features in those distinct clouds, 
and discover that they themselves actually were made up of billions of stars. So we knew that they couldn't be inside our galaxy, even though we didn't have a notion of what a galaxy properly was. We, um, we thought that we were just kind of in a sea of stars, and outside of that sea was just empty space, I guess. At the same time that astronomers started to appreciate and understand the geography of the Milky Way, some of them began to wonder whether these nebula might be other islands in space. So, um, you know, they were just so distant that maybe their accumulation of light from all their stars just ended up looking like a faint patch in our night sky. This suggestion caused a fierce debate. Um, it was the most important thing on most astronomers' minds in the early 1900s especially in light on the tail end of Einstein's discovery of relativity. Because that would, um, mainly because it would, it would rush in a new world view, it would require a paradigm shift, because that would mean that distances um, of these galaxies were greater than anything we had ever um, even considered before that. So it opened up the view of the universe to be millions of times larger than we once thought. And we once thought, you know, we thought that even those small distances before that were large. So you can imagine the backlash when um, astronomers had only really just recently right before that discovered that the Milky Way itself was several tens of kilometers, or no, sorry, kiloparsecs across. So, um, you know, maybe a hundred thousand light years was, of course, you know, it's still unimaginably long and large distance, but now we discovered that the universe, or at least some galaxies that we could observe, were not tens of thousands of light years across or distant. They were millions, millions of light years distant. And that opened up a whole new revelatory perception of our, of our universe and our place in the universe. But, um, you know, naturally with the people in power at the time, they didn't want to give up their paradigm. So the status quo maintained that it was just clouds of gas that we were mistaking for really distant galaxies. The only way to find out whether that was true or not was uh, to try to identify individual stars in the galaxies and that's exactly what Hubble did they noticed um, supernova they used stellar exploding stars called nova really really big ones are called supernova and they noticed that all of them have about the same amount of brightness as well. And so they were able to use that um, nova that they observed in the Milky Way to get their distance. And once they got their distance, they were able to discover that if they were to observe another one in the future, they could compare the brightness or luminosity of that supernova that nova with the new one that they're observing now and, and be able to tell just how far away the uh, the new nova must be and then um, 
there's another kind of star called a Cepheid. This is a Cepheid variable. They have a brightness that can be inferred from their other properties. If you know the true brightness of a star, it's easy to work out how far away it is by measuring how, how bright it appears. Just like if you know a car light shines at an exact luminosity when you're right up next to it, you can measure that. And now, a year from now, you see that same car and you know that it's that same model headlight. You see it five miles away, you can go back and get the data and record what it is and be able to be able to deduce how far away that headlight you're looking at is based on the known properties you've previously measured from it. So if the astronomers could identify Nova or Cepheids in the nebulae that was being contested, they would be able to work out roughly how far away they were. And briefly, this is the telescope, one of the ones used in working out the size of our galaxy. And just to give you an idea on the scale right there, that's a bench. That's a bench for a, a good comparison relative to human size, how big these things were. So this thing is probably 50, 60 feet long and um, maybe six feet across. Just unimaginable. And this is, this is stuff that they built in the early 1900s, late 1800s even. So, I always love how, how much money people in, in effort and in technology and in invention, innovation, went into the tools that early astronomers used. It's for me it's a it's a testament to the optimism and hope of humans in general. And this picture right here is Supernova 1987A, uh, named for the year in which it was discovered, a huge stellar explosion, photographed in March of 1987, and they were to have found other ones, they go along the uh, alphabet, as you can imagine, just tacking letters onto the end of it, the year. like the Milky Way, made up of a central bulge of stars surrounded by a thinner disk. I'm pretty sure this is Andromeda, right here. So it turned out to be just possible to make these crucial measurements for stars in some of the nebula in the 1920s, using what was then the best telescope in the world. It's actually still in use today. The one we actually just saw, it says it's as a 100 inch diameter mirror called the Hooker Telescope after the guy who paid for it, the benefactor. It's located on top of Mount Wilson near Pasadena in California. And the astronomer who made the crucial measurements was Edwin Hubble. Hubble, Hubble, Hubble. He identified both Cepheids and Novae, Nova, Novae, in nebulae that are now known to be the closest galaxies to the Milky Way. It turned out that not all of the nebulae were other galaxies. Some of them were actually clouds of dust, and uh, these objects play an important part in the life cycles of stars 
in the origin of planetary systems like our own. But in order to avoid confusion, um, in order to avoid confusion, astronomers kept the name nebulae for the clouds within the Milky Way. And we used, um, yeah, and you of course just used the, I guess, current term for the universe, the galaxy, for greater star systems beyond the Milky Way. Even with the 100-inch telescope, it was very difficult to make observations needed to calculate the distances to the galaxies, though. Here, uh, the sun and the moon being both the same size, same apparent size in our sky, perfectly cover each other up, and so when we do experience a full solar eclipse, we're able to see the solar flares and other stellar prominences, like the corona. It makes a beautiful halo around the moon when it's covered up. When the sun's covered up. So, to wrap up our story, of how we know about other galaxies, when Hubble first began to make measurements of the distances involved, he found that although the galaxies uh, did indeed lie beyond the Milky Way, they did not seem to be as big as ours. But it's all a matter of perspective. One of the few things we can actually measure is the area the galaxy covers on the sky. A small galaxy close up will of course cover the same area as a big galaxy far away. Mm. In the same way the moon completely covers the sun during a total solar eclipse, because although the sun is almost 400 times bigger than the moon, it's also almost 400 times further away, interestingly enough. And that's really, uh, that's a really interesting coincidence, don't you think? I mean, I don't know what the explanation would be other than coincidence, but I don't think, I don't know. I don't think Venus even has a moon. Mercury doesn't. Mars definitely doesn't have a moon that would be able to cover up the sun to that accurate of a precision, a closeness to the same size as the, uh, the sun. But anyways, as telescopes got better, astronomers were able to measure the distances to the other galaxies more and more accurately. So they used many different stepping stones, not only Cepheids and Novae, but also comparisons of the brightness of things such as globular clusters in one galaxy with those in another. After more than half a century of effort, they found that the galaxies were about 10 times further away than Hubble had once thought. And, and Hubble actually because it doesn't look like they're really getting around to this. Cepheid variables are... They obviously, by their name, they vary in brightness in a very predictable way. And Hubble was able to use that to determine that they were coming from not just tens of thousands of light years away, but millions of light years away. The reason Hubble was able to analyze Cepheid variables and determine the distance is because they all they exhibit a luminosity or, or brightness that's in very close correlation with the period or the frequency at which they vary, the luminosity varies. So they have variable brightness that goes up and down as the, uh, the star turns around. And Hubble was able to look at some variables some varying stars all the way in the Andromeda Nebula and Triangulum 2, the uh, third largest galaxy in our, uh, our local group of galaxies. 
and he was able to notice that, hey, there's Cepheid variable stars. They're clearly varying um, exactly like Cepheid variables do in our own galaxy, but they're way, way dimmer. And uh, based on looking at, you know, at, at least tens, if not hundreds, of different Cepheid variables relatively close by in our Milky Way, he was able to tell that, no, 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 this thing's way too dim to, uh, to be inside our own galaxy. And once he presented this, he was only 35. That's another amazing feat about this thing. Once he presented that um, in public, all the other scientists had no choice but to, uh, you know, accept this well-received, very diligently cultivated observational evidence. And uh, if it wasn't for Einstein, he might have been one of the more famous, one of the most famous scientists of the 20th century, even though he still kind of is. It's pretty interesting. Um, So not only Cepheids and Nova are used, but comparisons of brightest things such as globular clusters being just millions of densely packed stars in a very small space um, across galaxies are measured, we already said that. After more than half a century of effort, they found that the galaxies were about ten times further away than he thought, as much as they did in the sky. So, Cepheids and Novae are, are still very much used. In the 1990s, using Cepheid distances obtained from the Hubble Space Telescope, Cepheid variables, um, a team at the University of Sussex, finally showed that the Milky Way is an average galaxy of its type. So yeah, like our position in it, as it says, as it wants to emphasize, there's nothing particularly important about the Milky Way galaxy. So the result of all these efforts is a clear understanding of the sizes of galaxies and the distances between them as well as disk spiral galaxies, like the Milky Way, there are much larger elliptical galaxies, which don't have a disk or spiral shape, but they're like ellipsoid, like almost like rugby balls, um, or really fat frisbees. And these are thought to have been built up by cosmic cannibalism, which, that's just a vivid way of saying that there are mergers between different types of more um, sharply defined shapes of galaxies. And there are also smaller elliptical galaxies um, smaller elliptical galaxies small irregular galaxies which have no distinct shape. And the largest elliptical galaxies contain several thousand billion stars. So several trillion stars. Whereas ours um, contain only a few hundred billion stars. So just a small fraction of the amount of some of these stars. Galaxies are much closer together relative to their own size than the stars are to one another. That's an interesting thing I never really thought about. Again though, it's a matter of perspective. In the if we if we adapt the aspirin analogy to galaxies I think the other one was, it would have been, oh shoot, what was it, 140 kilometers away, between
between two aspirin is what it's like between us and the nearest star. So if the Milky Way is a single aspirin now, then the Andromeda Galaxy would just only be 13 centimeters away. And then add just three meters or about, you know, 10 feet away from that, then you're going to find a huge collection of about 2,000 galaxies spread over the volume of a basketball, representing a group of galaxies known as the Virgo Cluster. On a scale where a single aspirin represents the Milky Way, the entire observable universe would then be only a kilometer across. What? I mean, you know, an aspirin compared to a kilometer, that's, that'd be a long way for it to travel, but I can at least imagine that. I never really considered, like, an analogy like that before. To me, that's, oh man, that really gets me. I love it. I really, really like that. And then the entire observable universe would only be a kilometer across. It would contain hundreds of billions of aspirin. In terms of galaxies, the universe is definitely a crowded place. Very cool. Thanks so much for watching, guys. I appreciate all the continued love and support. I love uh, journeying, especially in the space. But of course, history, psychology, philosophy, all that as well. Let's uh, give it up for the 50th anniversary of the Apollo mission. Hope you're looking forward to some content on that. And yeah, looking through this book a little bit more before I have to return it. It was fun. Hope you guys like it. Sleep well. Bye, guys.